Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Rolling the Bones Around the Cage with Grizzly and Gumshoe Val. How's everybody doing this evening? What's going Hello. on, Val? How you Hello, doing? Hello, Grizz. Hello, Grizz from cloudy Detroit, Michigan. Cold Detroit, That's Michigan. Right. Welcome, adventures in Harlem with Jimmy B. Howdy, howdy. How you doing? Welcome to another edition. We have some lineup tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, absolutely. So how's everybody's weekend been? So, yeah. So what's going on with you, Val? Well, I hear, we have, a, uh, I hear we have an excellent uh, guest today. And, yeah, um, so well, tell me about this guest. Pretty excited about it. You know, MK is a friend of mine, and I followed him for some time. And the guy's background is, is, is an elite background. You look at his background. This is an expert computer man. He's highly educated. Uh, he's, 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 a, uh, he's the ultimate Bigfoot enthusiast. And really? I think he's got, he's got what it takes that people take notice of. When he puts out a video, people sit back and take notice of it. And they wow. discuss it a lot. But uh, he's going to be with us today, and I understand that uh, MK will will uh, only be with us for thirty minutes. Oh, in which well, case, we bring him on then. We Let's have uh, we have Mark Daniels coming in from Texas. Uh, okay, MK Davis, a, welcome to the show. Hello, welcome. Hello. Tell us all about you. Yeah. Thanks welcome. for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. So welcome to Rolling the Bones Around the Cage with Grizzly and Gumshoe Val. So, uh, MK, MK can ahead. you can you share uh, a, a real quick uh, bio of yourself, uh, where you come from, what your background is, and what keeps you motiv motivated? Well, uh, my, my background uh, in Bigfooting is I kind of backed into it uh, through an interest in astronomy, uh, oddly enough. Uh, I, I became interested in astrophotography, and I had uh, had set myself up to to do that, and I had learned quite a bit about film and, uh, and how to get the most out of film, how to choose the right films, uh, that type of thing. And then one day, I saw uh, a couple of frames from the Patterson film, and they had. Uh, been treated much the way you would an astro photo and it caught my attention and they were they were superior frames i mean they were fantastic and, and i knew that they could not have come from any of the copies that i'd seen on television that somewhere there was a better copy and uh i, I just began an inquiry i'm a curious person uh, so it, one thing led to another, and I ended up going up to uh, going up to Oregon uh, to the Western Bigfoot Society conference up there, and I met some people there uh, who helped me to get more frames, and, and so I began this odyssey of collecting frames from the closer to the original film, and when I got them all, and then I put them through the a processing that that would make sharpen them up and then i took the hand motions out of the that's in the camera you know from running and shooting yes and then one night about two o'clock in the morning i hit preview and my jaw dropped it really was, it was so much detail uh the the musculature uh, the biomechanics were there, the the kind that you see every day in life uh, when you see the human body and the human anatomy, mm -hmm. and uh, you see muscles moving, back <coughs> muscles moving, that type of thing. Uh, well, then then the question became, you know, what is the nature of it? You know, I no longer question whether it was real after that moment. But I was became interested in what the nature of it was. So it began just an odyssey uh, that has led me to this very moment. Right. Wow. So it sounds like it sounds like you got your start there 
And it was at that moment that you realized that this is not a myth. This is not something made up. It's for real. How did that realization strike you, MK? Well, uh, a sense of importance came over me because it's it's tongue in cheek until mm -hmm. that moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and and from that moment on, you know that it's important. Mm -hmm. No one has to tell you that this is something real, really special. I had a difficult time uh, w during my sighting back in um, Michigan, 2014. And um, it was one of those what the F moment kind of things, MK, where I seen this yeah. and my mind wasn't ready to grasp this this thing as it was happening in front of my face. And um, it took me a while to get back out there in the woods after, after seeing this. And um, it was at that moment that I realized this is what people, people are, are seeing. This is what people are talking about. And it's, it's a for real thing. It's not a, it's not a uh, make believe. It's not a, it's not a mess. But a live, living, breathing creature. Creature. So it was. Tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is what everybody talks about, ladies and gentlemen. You're in, you know, Val. You're not alone, and and people actually talk about this on a regular basis. Now, how it actually affects them. Well, it's it's uh, it, it they it, it just so happened that they they kind of got the right guy when they got me because I'm just hard-headed enough <laughs> to stay on it. You know, uh, it, it, there are times when you get very discouraged, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're, it's a subject where, you know, the, the high points don't come by that often, you know, but when they do, it, it's exhilarating. You know, back in March 213, uh, 2013, when I seen that video that you put out uh, relative to the black and white Sasquatch fighting each other on video. Do you recall that, that oh, uh, yeah. video? Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you about, uh, MK, what is your opinion of Bigfoots themselves being a warring, a warring creature? Have you heard that before? I have as a data miner researcher. Um, I can tell you what the lady who owned the place mm -hmm. told me. She said there are two kinds there on the place, and they one kind looks like more of an apish look to it. And he said the other kind, if you put some clothes on it, you might could get on the bus with it and no one pay attention to you. Really? That's crazy. Now that yeah, is crazy. That's creepy. <laughs> and, and she said that they, they did not like each other and they fall. Wow. Now, MK, now I am going to play uh, a sh short little video, and I want you to narrate this for the ladies and gentlemen out here, okay, to let them know what you are talking about, right? Uh, because uh, this is very important, right? So you know what this video is. And there is uh, the picture we're talking about. Remember this video? Oh, yeah. So I'm just going to play just a few seconds of it. And I just want you to just talk about it. Just, okay, let me blow it up on my end. So this way people can understand. Uh, let me unmute it and hit play. This is the Patterson Gimlin film, which he shows to his anatomy students. I'm also including some stabilized footage from a Reddit user that helps illustrate Jeff's point. Say, all right, I want you to point out as many landmarks of surface anatomy and muscle masses that you can identify. And they start at the head and they can see the trapezius, they can see the deltoid, they can see the lateral and long heads of the triceps. You can see the erector spinae down the back. You can see the shoulder blades moving under the skin. I mean, you just go on and on from top to bottom. You, you can pick out all these features, none of which don't show up in a, <clears throat> in a cheap off-the-shelf costume. Costume menu. So, you know, that's what sold me, right? And not only that, but what you have done as well. I mean, 
I mean, is that not correct? What the the, the muscles moving? Yeah, I've, I've got better footage than that. Yeah, though. I know. Yeah, you do have better footage. It, but it, I, it, I mean, I don't have it with me. I mean, I'm just using that as an example, though. Yeah, it's 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 uh it's hard to to deny. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you see it every day in life, and uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, to, to imagine that anyone would construct a suit that would mimic all of those muscles in concert. Mm -hmm. uh, just just can't happen. Mm -hmm. No. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you actually watch that video a little further, it actually shows Planet of the Apes, uh, the movie back then, and it would show the comparison of the costumes they have comparison to that film. And there is no way, no way, comparison at all, what was filmed and what the TV production crew has actually fabricated. So can I, I, can I mention point. something uh, regarding yeah. that? Yes, sir. Um, a good friend of mine, she's passed away now, but uh, she, her name was Bobby Short. Oh, yeah. And Bobby Short found John Chambers, the, the, the makeup guy who won the Academy Award <laughs> for Planet of the Apes. And she and found him in a nursing home, and she arranged right. for an interview, and she asked him about it. And he says, he says, there's no way I could create anything like that. He says, but when people, people gave me credit for it, I didn't deny it. Oh, because, wow. Because it was good for business. Mm -hmm. So that's what he told her. Oh, well, makes sense. And, and I might, I might add MK that and Chris, uh, Bobby Short at the, for the time that she lived, she was very, very well, well respected for what she knew and who she knew involved in the big, Bigfoot world, Bigfoot community, very well respected person. She wrote some beautiful stuff. I learned a lot from her stuff. Yeah, I did too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good stuff. And still refer to it, you know, off and on. I'll go back and refer to her stuff. But uh, back to that video, that, that 2013 video, MK, what impressed me most about that video was not only the fact that these two creatures, the black, the white, were fighting, they were tussling out there, but this all, this all ends when a gargantuan steps in the middle of this. I, my question to you is, have you ever estimated the height of that big, Creature that stepped into the uh, fray to break this up? I'm guessing about 12 feet. Wow. Serious. I'm serious because I and, stood right in that spot. And and if I'm not mistaken, if I seen the video correctly, there was a barn or something in the background. Do we know the measurement of the eave of the roof of that barn to the ground? Well, it was it was on a, the slope of a hill. Okay. But it, it varied, but I think that probably the shortest was about nine feet. Mm -hmm. That was the front. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's massive. That is it, massive. It towered above it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I stood there, I got yeah. someone else to, to, to take my picture there. Mm -hmm. And I was just a little bitty thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, uh, that it's, it's sobering. Mm -hmm. when you realize what you're seeing there, you know, something that's really <laughs> out of the bounds of, of, a, of a human being uh, that we've never seen a human being. No. A no. normal human being that was anything close to that. Eight, eight feet, I think, Robert Wadlow was eight feet something, but he wasn't that tall. No. So people ask... Where, how come more people don't see these 12 footers or, or 14 footers or 15 footers? Uh, the lady told me that he wasn't f even from around there, mm -hmm. he was a, a sojourner, he mm -hmm. he, he kind of came and went, mm -hmm. and she suspected that he came from up in 
north of there from up into the mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't show up until that they had gotten these others kind of acclimated where they were hanging around. And then he, he showed, starts showing up. Um, and they didn't want any part of those ones that were fighting. They took off. Mm-hmm. They, they, he busted them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if that was his intention or not, but they ran. And he he, he turns around and then the thing ends. Mm-hmm. A battery or something. Now, yeah. if, if we can, uh, sir, if we could just recap what we're talking about. We have a lot of people coming in. And if we can just recap what what we're talking about and then bring them up to speed, because uh, I know they got a lot of questions that's going to be popping. Yeah, uh, that, they're ta- we're talking about East Texas. Uh, there's a kind of a I, I, I hesitate to use the word habituation because I, I really don't think that that's what they were trying to do. Or the, the researchers there, I I think they were doing out of curiosity anything that would make them have a reaction if it was food that's fine they tried hanging different colored items in the trees they uh just uh they put out a soft futon for hoping they would lay on it it was just things they tried and and then they they did the same thing with the cameras they didn't get success at first but Gradually, over time, they realized what they could do with the cameras, and they had their some of their best stuff they filmed into a mirror mm-hmm. because the, these things had figured out which side of the camera was the business end, and and uh, I get maybe maybe they saw the light, the infrared light, I don't know, but when they they filmed into the mirror, all the action was going on behind the camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they began to pick up some good, pretty good stuff. So that that's just that's just using savvy, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, paying attention and and trying to overcome or work around a problem. Mm-hmm. You know? I thought it was pretty pretty smart. I've I've been through over one hundred and thirty eight thousand reports. I read, I analyze, I look for uh, confluences and connections to anomal- uh, anomalies within reports for patterns. And I've never, uh, that I remember, that I recall, I never found a report uh, researchers using mer- mirrors in such a manner. It is very ingenious to think about it. Well, it's a kind of a low tech solution, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to a, a problem that it's it did the, it did the trick, uh, and they continued until one day uh, the big the, I guess the Bigfoot did it. They, they found their mirror shattered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so these aren't these aren't dumb animals. These aren't dumb dumb creatures. I, I, I assume they they must not be. Uh, wow! It, 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 if the if the ones that I have had experience with were dumb, then I'm dumb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. An- an- another video that really took me uh, for a loop was the uh, the uh, slalom skiers at uh, Yellowstone Park. That video you made of the uh, the creatures, the individuals uh, approaching buffalo, bison. Had we ever have you ever uh, come to a conclusion on that? Uh, no, no, I've, I've watched it. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 often the distance when you blow it up, they just become, you know, just uh, fuzzed, fuzzed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would like to see it in a clearer way. You know, I, uh, it, it's it's uh, you know just to know that that it wasn't something else, or a grizzly bear walking on its hind feet or something. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and probably it, it's probably what he says it is, but, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, that, that, that's a wild place up there. So. It is a wild place. Yeah. But I know for certain that I've found reports from the Yellowstone National Park of Bigfoot reports and Bigfoot sightings all throughout that place. And another thing that I had 
uh, to counter that, the uh, the skeptics that talk about uh, people skiing. I don't know of any national park uh, agent um, that will that will allow anybody to go out there with skis and cross country ski out there in the middle of the park where they don't allow people around these these wild animals. It doesn't happen. So well, the, uh, a buffalo is probably one of the worst. Yeah. You're more likely to get injured by a buffalo than you are a grizzly bear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen what they can do. Mm -hmm. they, they do not like it. They don't like it when people come out there and they flash a camera mm -hmm. flash and, 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 and they will pin you to a tree and, and proceed to stomp a mud hole on you. You know, uh, they don't hesitate. Uh, so, you know, uh, I can understand uh, what, what whoever these people were out there were pretty nervy, mm -hmm. you know, to approach Buffalo. Uh, maybe they knew the Buffalo wouldn't do anything. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Hmm. So oh, I would take the chance. That's for sure. I wouldn't. No, no. And I just don't see the park officials allowing anybody to to recreate out there in in the in the wild near animals yeah. of any type, whether bear or buffalo or anything. I just don't see it. It's you not can happening. see some, some videos on YouTube of buffalo stomping people. Mm -hmm. and a few of them is right there by the by that store, you know, they have out there by Old Faithful, you know, where mm -hmm. people gather. Uh, the, the people just decided they would go over there and, and get in the buffalo's face. And uh, that buffalo uh, promptly ejected them. Well, I, I, I hear the Old Faithful is pretty hot. I wouldn't want to be around a hot shower like that. That's not for me. This old boy, stay away from that area. I took some uh, <laughs> infrared video of Old Faithful. I know exactly mm -hmm. how hot it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, when you listen to some of these people post the things that they do, what they think that is, it none of it makes sense. None of it makes sense at all. There's no reason, well, no logic it, in it. Some people have this spirit about them, you know. Mm -hmm. where they just got to try it. Mm -hmm. They just got to give it a try. <laughs> and I think if, if a Bigfoot would stay still long enough, somebody would probably try it with him, too. You know, they'd go up to him. They do. <laughs> they go out take there a, and try to feed it. Take a snapshot. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, do you use exercise due caution? Mm -hmm. So how many sightings have you had, MK, over your lifetime? Not that many, mm -hmm. oddly enough. I, I filmed one down in Bluff Creek, but I didn't know I filmed it until I, much later when reviewing the video. Um, I saw one in Louisiana. And uh, let's see, how many have I seen? Uh, three. 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 Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the rest have been uh, my, my knowledge and base is garnered from very good descriptions from other people. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So do a lot of people send you videos and ask you to analyze it, look at yeah, it? Yeah, uh, a lot of people do. Uh, the, the thing about videos is uh, it's hard. To, you can't hardly make something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand when you take something like that, your eyes have seen a lot better than mm -hmm. any that a camera can record. Mm -hmm. So a person that has seen seen one and filmed it, and his film didn't turn out, is is it's like a cruel thing. I mean, it's it, it's it's not fair mm -hmm. because if you get a good view of it with your eyes. And then if you, it don't turn out, you can't show the next guy. Thank you. Somebody just validate what Grizzly's been preaching for the past couple of years. M.K. Davis. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. And it's, yeah. it's, uh, to me, it's that's everything. If I saw one and I'm alone, I might not say nothing. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I need to, I need to share it with somebody. You know, I, it, it, and, and take a good film. Uh, I, I bought a, a new camera, and it, that thing is so crystal clear. And I look forward if any opportunity comes up. I practice on, you know, getting getting to the controls, you know, mm -hmm. learning the controls. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because I want to share it, you know. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I. I oh, I'm sorry, Val. Go ahead. I um, I've always told people if you're going to have a Bigfoot encounter, try to have somebody with you. For one, it's a witness. For two, um, somebody needs to somebody needs to have some sense because when you see something like this, you're out of sorts. It, it takes you for a loop that uh, some people might not be able to handle. Uh, it's, it's also try to try to have two cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, digital age, you know, people people will doubt a single camera, mm -hmm. even if it's a clear video. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have two cameras, and it shows the same thing from two different angles. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's, they know it's not CGI. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you 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 do that for the viewer's benefit, not for your own, because you you saw it with your eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know that you you you're 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 pretty much uh, locked in on on whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, the people. If you just tell a story, well, it's just a story. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a couple of cameras rolling, it might make the news. I mean, you actually got a point. And, you know, and I tell people, I was going to say, and I didn't mean to interrupt Val, uh, I used to be a firearms instructor for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And I always tell people muscle memory, you know, uh, with your firearm. Uh, take your camera and go out and try to film a squirrel running around, jumping tree to tree and see how well you do with that out of nowhere and practice. And you will be surprised how well you do not capture a clear picture of that squirrel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, ladies and gentlemen, that sounds funny, but, you know, that is a target to practice with and to train yourself to try to get acclimated with. When you're walking in the woods, uh, especially if you use the zoom, that mm -hmm. is correct. If you use the zoom, you probably won't get the score off. That that is correct. You can't keep it on. Because uh, how many times have we heard? Oh my God! Here comes another blob squab picture. Uh, mm -hmm. Here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. You know, but like you like you said, and it always says, Mister Davis. You know. I know what I saw, but even though this my picture is did not turn out, I was there. Mm -hmm. But I, I always I ask the question, good. what what motivated you to take this picture? You know, why did you take this picture? What did mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. uh, and and let them tell the story and, and I, I try to integrate all of that into one. Uh, so that if your report's going to be made, that all all of that enters into it, you know. Uh, right. It's it, it's it's not easy, or there would be plenty of pictures. Mm -hmm. It you is know, not easy. Not, no. Not easy. No. No. And that's some of the things that I remind people when they complain about the picture being blurry and blob squatch. You go out there and do it. You you be the one in a hundred that are able to successfully take a picture, a postcard perfect picture, bring it back and show us and let us critique it for you. It's very tough. It's tough taking a picture. It's tough having people critique it for you. It's very tough. Well, that's what makes the Patterson film so unique. Mm -hmm. That is, is, is one of the older pieces of evidence, but yet it's right in there amongst the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and and, and, and with with uh, technology, it's getting even better. Mm -hmm. Well, from my understanding, Mr. Davis, uh, a lot of 
uh, Bigfoot investigators are going back to the old technology. So they don't have to worry about uh, the electronics of the digital stuff. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's different. It's different taking digital than it is from taking film and mm -hmm. then using digital on it, mm -hmm. you know, to right. enhance that. That's a whole nother matter. Uh, the, the, the Patterson film accepts enhancement very well because it was a decent film. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, you can't make something out of nothing, but if you have something, if you have a pretty decent film, you can make a spectacular film out of it using digital. That digital is correct. Techniques. Uh, so that's that's exactly what's happened with the Patterson film. It's it's uh, entered it's crossed that threshold. It's in the, the realm of the spectacular. Now, and we want to make a statement too, Mr. Daniels, that the Patterson film that we see is not the whole film that was filmed. Is that correct? Yeah. There is more is, to that film. Yeah. It's in, it's in three pieces. Right. And see, and that a lot of people don't realize that there was more footage to that actual recording. They're just showing just that one Sasquatch mm -hmm. because there was more footage before that. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. yeah, that's one of the yeah. things I was just thinking about, Chris, is you, as you were talking about that and it's funny you said that because i seen i seen some of the parts of these uh patty film uh mk that you did and, and i'll tell you what brother that opened my eyes up to a lot of things and a lot of things made sense the further i went into this the deeper i went into this it's um um it's an eye opener hey guys i hate to uh to cut out, but I'm gonna have to go. Um, mm -hmm. No, appreciate hey. it. I'll have it absolutely. Thank you I for coming to the chat. Absolutely appreciate it. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll we'll do it again if you'll let me come back, and we'll. No, uh, anytime, I'll give, sir, you, I'll give you the, yeah. the the whole hour at least, or maybe more. I, I love oh, it. Yeah, I love it. Thank you, sir. You, you have be safe, my sir. friend. Thanks Thank, a lot. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our wow. next guest, Mark Daniels. Let's welcome him to the show. Mark Daniels, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Uh, are you there? I think I'm he Mark. froze yeah. right there. Mark? Well, he was there. Let's give him a second here. But, yeah, so uh, he'll be back. Uh, he just got kicked off, but... But no, you're right, Val. And you know, it, there's there were there is more footage to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, a, a lot of people when they see things, you know, they don't know the whole story. They mm -hmm. they take things mm -hmm. what they hear as as the truth and nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. But if you if you break stuff down and watch the footage, mm -hmm. you know, there's no way. I don't think. And I'm whited out in my video. I got fix my monitors but there's mm -hmm. no way that that can really be a human being in a costume no. i mean no especially no. with the muscle movement and that that was my point with mr daniels y so, you know you know all right here mk mark yeah. is mark so let's on? Try to, there we go mr hey, hey mark all right how you hey, doing I'm, there, I'm sir? Having, how you doing my friend pretty good uh, i'm having a little technical difficulty that's okay. That's all right. all right. We'll work Welcome around to it. The show. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. I um, glad to have was you. almost late. Um, I, I thought this was going to be in the future, not today. So I, I apologize for that. Well, that, we apologize for everything, Mark, because this is a this is a work in progress. So yeah, no problem. You know, we'll, we'll make do. We'll make do. Yep. Everybody's going to be happy. And uh, we are we are pleased and very very happy to have you have you here. Absolutely, yes. Thank you, thank you. Glad to be here. So introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and give us some background on you. Okay, uh, my name is Mark Daniels. Um, I'm a construction worker by trade, and uh, I got interested in the uh, Bigfoot. Uh, situation about um, oh gosh it's been probably 40 years ago 
Uh, my oldest daughter, which was 12 years old at the time, had a face-to-face uh, meeting from just a few feet away with a uh, juvenile Sasquatch. And wow. uh, this was in uh, southwest Missouri, close to a little town called Chill Knob on uh, Table Rock Lake. Mm-hmm. We were there um, camping for the weekend, and she uh, was going uh, out to hang up a bathing suit behind the cabin that we had rented. And as she came around the corner of the cabin and, and it was, uh, uh, it was getting dark, you know, it was still just a little bit of daylight, but anyway, uh, he was looking in the uh, window of our, of our cabin when she startled him. So he turned and, um, they faced each other at about 10 feet apart. He started swaying back and forth and then he turned and walked into the, um, tree line. And, um, I put that kind of on the shelf for many years, but um, I'd think about it once in a while. And then um, about probably 10 years ago, um, I started doing a little research, mostly just reading what I could find on the topic. And uh, you know how it goes, you know, once, once you get hooked, you're hooked Mm -hmm. for life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started going out into the field about seven or eight years ago. And, uh, I've always enjoyed camping and uh, outdoor cooking and that sort of thing. And, um, but having um, a, a Sasquatch type being out there in the woods with you, uh, it, it makes you wonder exactly what your position in the food chain is and uh, <laughs> whether or not uh, there's a danger or, you know, so. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, so, uh, just, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, um, I, I run with about a half a dozen people right now um, that uh, we kind of, I guess you call us enthusiasts, uh, we, weekend enthusiasts. We, uh, we go camping as often as we can. One of the things that we're doing right now is investigating uh, nuisance animals. Um, we are looking into a, um, a situation at the moment where a rancher is losing calves in, in uh, southeast uh, Louisiana, and we just started that project, but uh, in the recent uh, past, we've uh, looked at uh, about three other um, situations where animals are being aggressive or uh, uh, making a nuisance of themselves, and uh, we're, we're just, um, you know, um, trying to help people out, understand what they're up against, and uh, how they can um, uh, deal with it. And uh, so far, nobody's been hurt. So mm-hmm. uh, other than now, some livestock. So now when you are saying animals, what are you referring to? I want to hear. It. Well, um, uh, livestock, mainly uh, calves, um, horses. What do you think is doing it? I think there's a delay or something. Go ahead. Chris. Yeah, what's causing yeah. this? What, what animals causing this, do you think? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What animal do you think is causing this? Who do you think is responsible for the missing uh, What animal? animal? Yes. Yes. Oh, well. Um, I, personally, I think it's a, a Sasquatch, Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that particular part of the uh, parish, uh, there seems to be a, um, a reduction in the um, uh, game animals like deer and hogs and things like that. And um, so that might have something to do with uh, the uh, problems with the uh, uh, livestock and uh, even the livestock feed. We've, we've uh, heard of situations where feed uh, uh, storage uh, places have been uh, um, have been uh, you know uh, broken into and that sort of thing doors ripped off uh, mm-hmm. and uh, pet food go go missing animal feed go missing uh, when I say animal right. I meant live ball feed mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And I actually get reports out of Tennessee where they will go into people's garden and take ears of corn and all of them. 
So yeah, yes, that yeah, that does happen. We recently you know, uh, go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of reports. You and I were talking last night about this, and there there are a lot of reports of calves and cows uh, turning up missing without any traces. And you're talking about calves are probably I don't know three four hundred three hundred pounds maybe, uh, and these things are are missing with with no hide, no, no evidence of carcass left around. But also that the, that uh, Miller document that came out a couple of years ago, supposedly by a uh, government person, uh, he he warned of the same thing. Uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch are very, very, you know, territorial. Uh, but when their resources diminish, they become oppor opportunistic. And for that reason, they can never, never exist with human beings. Why is that? And I think, I think Mark uh, did a wonderful job illustrating how or what they're dealing with down there in Louisiana and Texas you know, with the missing uh, livestock and stuff and everything that he says, the pet food, uh, the, the and, and Grizz, you, you mentioned the, the gardens and stuff. All of this stuff are reports that people make in the hundreds, in the hundreds. So we see that it's about resources, very much about resources. We've worked a couple of cases where um, people were actually putting food out for um, the wildlife. And mm -hmm. uh, in one case, we know she she was uh, knowledgeable that uh, Bigfoot was around and she was putting food out for the Bigfoot. And then uh, when she uh, stopped doing it, they started uh, messing with her property, um, pounding on the side of her house and tearing up her fascia and stuff on the uh, eve of the house. Mm -hmm. um, there's another situation in, um, uh, see, I guess that would be central Louisiana, where uh, evidently the young man's parents had been uh, putting food out for him. And when they uh, passed away and he took over the property, he had some um, aggressive nuisance uh, Bigfoots that were um, um, you know, just raising cane with him uh, to the point where he was afraid to live on the property. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they were um, throwing things at the house and, and uh, trying to get into the um, storage shed. And uh, that was a case where the, the door was ripped off the, uh, off the shed. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, you got to be very careful about what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Grizz, what do you do in, in situations like that? What would you do? So, uh, now, we talked to uh, Old Bear, you know, mm -hmm. and he travels oh, yeah. around the United States just like Mark does to try to mm -hmm. help people. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing I always recommend is, A, never feed them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, put up motion lights around around your house with the infrared beams to, to flood the area with lights. Uh, get trail cams uh, because they uh, evidently they do see the infrared, so they do stay away from that and put them up on your property. Uh, they're inexpensive now. They're not, you know, uh, very high tech when it comes to dollar wise. Uh, you can get some for under 50 bucks, put those around the property. But uh, you got to be careful, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, it, and we hear reports. Unfortunately, that, you know, people want to love and, and, and take care of them and, and treat them like puppy dogs. And, and we warn people and we hear cases like this. And it's just, you know, look, here's the deal. I'm just going to say it. That's why I own little dogs and not big dogs. Okay. Because I don't want to have a chance of that big dog ever turning and get aggressive with me. And I cannot handle that big dog. Now, I can handle a six or eight pound dog, but a hundred pound dog. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. That's why insurance companies won't insure you. Mm -hmm. So and I'm not, you know, saying what breed or anything like that, but I'm just saying animals are animals. You know, we don't know, but I'm not going to take a chance. I'm not going to say, Val, hold my beer. I'm going to go out there in the middle of this field and pet this line like I always say, you know, I mean. 
I mean, listen to Mark. Mark, I mean, this is in another state. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. are reports that we are receiving. Mm -hmm. These are testimonies, people. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not we, making uh, this we, we, uh, uh, We're going over into Mississippi, uh, into the National Forest over there, and we were having encounters and coming into our camp at night and that sort of thing. We think it was a uh, juvenile. Um, we found his footprints and stuff and found a handprint on my travel trailer. But um, uh, we were, as we were scouting around, we found a, um, a, a place that kind of looked like a uh, lookout. Mm -hmm. uh, it was at the end of a, um, uh, a uh, forest road, dead end, mm -hmm. and yeah. it was just off the road, and it was a cleared area where um, the, uh, the weeds and everything had been pulled out. Uh, there was a, a tr you know, about three or four trails going into this little opening, and you could observe the road from there. We found um, a, a bone pile, and most of the bones were canine. Uh, there were a couple of hog uh, skeletons, and uh, there was one um, alligator skeleton uh, close by. And um, so it, it kind of looked like whatever had been sitting there mm -hmm. observing was probably snacking. And <laughs> we suspect the canine uh, bones were probably uh, uh, pets from the surrounding area mm -hmm. that they had latched yeah. onto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One now, of the. I've got I'm sorry, Val. Go ahead, sir. Go. Uh, well, I was just going to say real quickly, one of the databases that I have uh, identifies uh, the different types of animals that I'm aware of through the reports that I've analyzed. And dogs make up a big portion of carcasses, favorites for Bigfoots and Sasquatch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of these, um, uh, skull, um, these skulls, they, they look like they were probably under 30 pound dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't real big. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it may have been a juvenile, you know, that was, uh, um, my, my personal opinion is the juveniles are probably the ones that do the lookouts, the sentry, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that uh, sometimes when we go into the, the national forest where, where they're at, we feel like we're under observation the whole time we're in there. And we'll he hear whistles occasionally and, and maybe a tree knock or two, uh, especially when we start moving uh, about. Like if we leave camp to go on a hike, a lot of times we'll hear uh, either a tree knock or a whistle um, that's possibly announcing that, uh, that we're on the move. Right. Now, I've got information from a person that uh, they have watchers that watch people. Uh, during the day, why the family or clan will sleep, mm -hmm. and they will have lookouts where they can see in a very long direction, like you just said, right? Mm -hmm. And she said how you can tell where they sit is that you'll find a bunch of small twigs broken or uh, pieces of bark that's been peeled in piles where they're bored and they're just doing nonsense stuff trying to pass time mm -hmm. and you can stand there and you can look and then you can look into another direction and you can see the other Sasquatch or Bigfoot, mm -hmm. I don't know, 60, 80, 90 yards mm -hmm. in a clear direction as well. And that's where they whistle and tree knock and let everybody know that yes, that there's activity coming and they alert the, the plan that whatever's like you said. So, mm -hmm. We found a situation uh, uh, like that not too long ago where one had been watching or waiting and watching. And what he seemed to have been doing is pinching off the end of the branches, like with his fingernail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there and um, there was a, a pretty significant pile of them on the ground. So he'd been been there for a while and he was just reaching up into the uh, the bush and just pinching off the ends of the limbs. Right. Now, that was a watcher location. That's, that's what she yep. tells me. So, yeah. So, you were very close to the, the whole family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. it, it really is. And, I mean, to, to understand that these creatures can 
think and have security like that, right? Mm -hmm. To stand by and have a defense system to watch for any intruders. I mean, what other animals do that besides us? Yeah, right? it takes cognizance, cognizance yeah. and, and forethought to think in terms of strategy and tactics and stuff like that. It's just, it's, you know, it's incredible to have sentries put out just like the military does. Who would know to put sentries up in a tree, post them up in a tree in a setting nest to watch a great distance? This is unbelievable. It really is. You're not dealing with dummies. You know, no. and, and, and uh, Grizz, when you were asking uh, Mark about, you know, referencing animals and stuff, I still reference Bigfoot Sasquatch as animals, and I use it in the database, multiple animals, to identify more than one uh, individual. I have no other meaning other than uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's adequate for me for, for, uh, documentation for database and stuff like that. But, uh, these are individuals and they're, they're living, live living beings. And, um, you know, you call them what you want, but I don't believe these were earthborn creatures. They're not, they're not from here originally, in my opinion. That's the way I think. Often uh, people, um, there's there's a couple of camps out there. People will refer to them as um, primates or mm -hmm. apes, wood apes, if you will. Um, then others will um, uh, compare, or compare them to humans or uh, mm -hmm. call them human-like. Mm -hmm. I personally believe they're a species of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. they, they have characteristics uh, of the primates. They have characteristics of the humans, uh, especially with a higher intelligence intelligent thought process but um they're not like us um mm -hmm. and they're not like um uh, a great ape or something uh, they're, they're just they're a species in their own i guess we can all agree they're a they're an enigma <laughs> they're not this yes. and they're not that but we know that they're they exist yeah and we do know a lot about them um, because of all the, uh, the reports, uh, not only across North America, but around the world. Mm -hmm. And the common threads that are um, uh, woven into these uh, stories that come from people, uh, uh, different walks of lives, um, you know, different backgrounds, no previous um, knowledge or understanding of a Sasquatch being. But mm -hmm. yet the stories uh, are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we go out into the field like we have been for the last six, seven years, we have experienced just about everything that you'll hear about or read about, from rock throwing to violent tree shakes to um, different types of vocalization um, to, um, you know, uh, tree limbs being thrown at us. Mm -hmm. uh, to being flanked on three sides, you know, mm -hmm. where they're trying to push us out of the area. Mm -hmm. um, just about everything that you, you can hear about or read about, we've experienced at one time or another. I have seen um, myself about six of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the one I saw closest up was in uh, New Mexico, just outside of Dallas on the Apache Reservation. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was at night, but I happened to shine my flashlight in his face, so I got a real good look at him. And when he uh left the area three or four seconds later, we went to where he had been uh standing and found a full footprint and a partial footprint that were around 17 inches. The scuff marks on the ground, he was down on all fours peeking through a bush at me as I walked past. He whistled, so I shined my flashlight towards a whistle, and I just surprised him. Well, he surprised me, too. Uh, it was quite a shock yeah, to both yeah, of us. Yeah. I told a friend of mine, I said, well, what drew my attention to him was he whistled at me. And he started chuckling. He said, he wasn't whistling at you. He was whistling at the one behind you. Uh, and um, we do know we did find out a few minutes later there was one on the other side because mm -hmm. it crossed the uh, – the road in front of the, our group uh, a few minutes mm -hmm. later. But anyway, uh, the others that I've seen, um, 
in the daytime have been tree peakers. Uh, they usually are off about a uh, hundred yards or so. Mm -hmm. And right. um, sometimes you, 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 you're just not sure if it's a, a tree stump or a shadow or what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I used to, before I kind of learned better, I would walk towards them and try to flush them out and get them to move. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they would, or I would um, uh, turn 180 degrees and start paying attention and, uh, you know, um, using my binoculars on something in the other direction. And then when mm -hmm. I turned back around, they'd be gone. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was I was looking at was no longer there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different things you can do to, to try to determine what it is you're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen them at night uh, several times on thermal cameras. You know, it, it's kind of funny because um, I guess they, they suspect that our nighttime vision is as good as theirs because mm -hmm. they hide from us at night too. Mm -hmm. They'll be peeking around trees and peeking over stumps and stuff uh, in, in pitch blackness. Mm -hmm. That's, amazing. That's interesting. interesting. It really is. And it's really, it's really uh, wonderful that we speak to different people from around the country, Grizz, that have these same ideas or different ideas, different approaches. But we all, we all come to the same uh, drinking trough you know to get our to get our fill and stuff it's wonderful yes it's very wonderful yeah. wonderful but um i am so glad that i was able to get a hold of you yesterday mark because you and i had been talking for for a little bit and uh hopefully you and eden can come on uh the show sometime and share your experiences yeah we'll, we'll, we'd be happy to um she has seen two of them in um, daylight mm -hmm. um, while riding in my pickup. We, mm -hmm. we do a lot of back road uh, scouting. That's We're primarily, good yeah, one of the things I look forward to uh, try to figure out if, they're, if they occupy an area or not is their tree structures. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't uh, take much stock in them, but I find them fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I probably got, uh, I don't know, between... My old phone, my three old phones. I probably got two or three hundred pictures of different types of structures in six wow. different states. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but anyway, uh, once we find um, a series of structures, then we know they're either in the area or they have been in that area mm -hmm. uh, sometime in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So we we that's what the areas that we camp at and yeah. we focus on. And, uh, and we don't have we don't have encounters uh, every time we go out. Um, but, uh, we go out frequently enough into areas where we know they, they are, that we do have, um, mm -hmm. opportunities, you know, we have considerable mm -hmm. encounters. Um, no, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's very interesting, you know, because a lot of people don't know about the watchers, uh, mm -hmm. the line of sight, uh, how they fidget and do things when they're bored. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I ever brought that up besides on another show. And yeah. when you were talking about the bones and stuff in that one area, it just triggered that, that thought to, to mention that. Mm -hmm. So and, and I think everybody should know that when you're out there, you know, looking around and so forth uh, to look mm -hmm. for stuff like that, because that is an indication that a watcher mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. sitting there <clears throat> paying attention to the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yep. beware. Mm -hmm. In the areas where we um, strongly suspect they're raising their young, uh, we have found, um, I guess over the years, probably three bedding areas. Uh, mm -hmm. They're in the south. It's uh, usually in the thick brush, in the in the real thickest of uh, the thickets, and. Um, when you're out hiking through the woods and you come up on a, a something that's uh, impenetrable, um, you you look at it and you your your first thought is I'm gonna walk around this. There's no way in the world I'm gonna hack my way through it. Right, yeah, that's probably where they're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, went into those areas um, before, and it's kind of funny because once we start getting in there, we start finding trails, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, you get into a clearing area where obviously something has cleared it, you know, 
by uh, pulling the weeds out of the ground and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, you'll find multiple trails. There'll be at least uh, three entrances and exits. Mm -hmm. And um, the ones we found have been pretty close to the, uh, the, the creeks, uh, the secondary creeks. Um, we, we stumbled across one, one time that, uh, I wish I'd had my thermal camera with me because I think I could probably shot, uh, uh, the camera on the ground and found a, a hot heat spot. We think they were in there as we approached it and they, they mm -hmm. went out the back. Vac uh, vacated quickly. There's something I read recently about, uh, military actively seeking out Bigfoot nests because they go in there and, um, test for sample DNA, because they know that these Bigfoot nests are where uh, the young are, are, are birthed, and they know the approximate time of the season this occurs, so they actively look for this, go out there and search and stuff for this stuff. The one of the ones that we uh, stumbled across, and it was close. It was on the Natchez River in Texas, close to. Um, um, oh shoot. Um, I'll think of it in a second. Uh, but anyway, um, as we were checking this place out, we started hearing whistles and movement in the uh, uh, woods around us. Mm -hmm. And so we feel like they were they were in the area. Boykin Springs is a place I'm thinking of. It's it was close mm -hmm. to there. And um, but you know, it's um, I used to go out uh, solo a lot. Uh, and, uh, sometimes I just sleep in the cab of my truck. Um, sometimes I would, um, uh, pitch a tent. Um, I came across a beagle dog that I found in the national forest in, uh, South, uh, East Oklahoma. And she's been, uh, my, uh, booger dog, uh, for the last, uh, five years. Wow. And, um, she was, uh, when I found her, she was running with some, uh, free range cattle. And I kind of suspected that she was with a cattle for protection mm -hmm. because um, we, we knew that there was a pretty good concentration of uh, Bigfoot in that particular area. Um, I strongly suspect um, that since she's been with me, she has been chased by Bigfoot twice while in the woods. Mm -hmm. She um, came running. Um, um, I was looking for a game camera that we had uh, misplaced. And uh, I've been in, down in the woods for about 30 minutes. And as a matter of fact, on this, let me back up a little bit and tell you the whole story. Uh, yeah. When we got to this area where uh, we had placed this game camera, um, there had been uh, some uh, tree structures that we had been monitoring for a couple, three years. And um, uh, watching them get rebuilt, yeah. and, you know, um, or, or uh, cleaned up, so to speak. Uh, some of them got tore down. But uh, anyway... Um, I looked in the direction when I pulled up of where one of the TP structures had been and between it and uh, where I was sitting, there was a new structure. So I got out of my pickup and I walked over and I usually take uh, photographs on, you know, four, four sides. Uh, sometimes if it's pretty intricate, I'll uh, shoot uh, half a dozen close-ups or so, but I was doing a northwest, south, and east uh, type of photograph, and so I walked on down into the woods with my dog to look for that game camera, and I was gone for about 30 minutes. She wandered off, uh, sniffing, you know, as beagles do, and uh, I got back to the pickup. There was a um, structure that had been built just off of my left front fender while I was gone. Uh, this was Didn't in the it? fall. Yeah, this was in the fall, and the, there was quite a bit of leaf litter on the ground, and I could see where the leaves had been turned over. Mm -hmm. The wet side is now up. Um, there's something that was shuffling around building this structure while I was in the woods. So I was getting a, a little bit uh, concerned about my dog. I was wanting her to get back up there so we could get the heck out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. And um, I was trying to call her without being too vocal, but anyway... After about five minutes or so, she come tearing up that hill, and normally uh, she's she's trained to um, come to um, the uh, passenger door, and I open it, and she jumps in. Mm -hmm. She ran under the truck, and she got under the differential, and I had to get down on my belly and crawl under the truck and grab her and pull her out. 
and she was hyperventilating so bad. I thought she was going to die there for a minute. She couldn't get to catch her breath. Mm-hmm. So I'm uh, well, fairly certain on that particular day, one got after her mm-hmm. and, uh, and she, um, she's warned me several times in the woods. Um, we were in camp one night, just her and I, and I was getting ready to uh, go to bed. We had a a little two man tent pitched and she started growling and looking in um, uh, the direction of the wood line. And so I looked up uh, in the direction she was looking just in time to see a rock come sailing in. Mm. And then there was another occasion where um, about 12 of us were camping. We each had our own tent, so we had 10 or 12 tents. And uh, she uh, woke me up growling, and uh, it turned out we had one or two of them in camp that night. We, uh, I know we've had a, in, in our camp about three or four times. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll, uh, if they have us under observation after we bed down and get quiet about an hour or so later, uh, they may sneak into camp and kind of look around and try to get into the ice chest. Uh, the last time it happened, myself and my nephew were camping in southeast Oklahoma. And uh, I suspect we, based on the size of the footprints, I probably had a mother and a, and a juvenile come into camp that night. And uh, I was laying in my tent and we had been cooking uh, the, the night before. And I heard the, um, uh, the ice chest slide across the uh, trailer that I had it sitting on. And I had a little camping stove on the uh, tailgate of my pickup and I heard something pick it up and set it down. And so I just laid there to see what was going to happen next. I knew what the sounds were. And sure enough, when we got up the next morning, I found the, uh, the footprints, we found a clump of hair that came off of something, uh, black hair. And, um, we had both of us had um, handprints on our vehicles and I, we had uh, smudges on the ice chest and the stove from handprints. Hmm. Wow. Curious. Yeah. I could not lay in a tent, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I would come out, guns a blazing, shooting up in the air, blasting away. I'm sorry. That, that we- is great. Yeah, we are armed, but uh, so far, I mean, um, uh, Eden uh, Boudreaux, uh, she had one tap her on the leg one night. Uh, oh no! Oh, and no. Uh, it uh, we we say we think it was a couple of juveniles, and mm-hmm. I think they had been watching us uh, during the daytime. But after we bedded down that night, and it, it was a cold night. It was in February, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, the wind was blowing. The temperature was probably in the 30s, I'm guessing. And uh, her and Valerie uh, decided to sleep outside on cots. Mm-hmm. But they um, they not only had their sleeping bags, but they had a tarp that they put over themselves because it was uh, trying to rain. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, I was I had an RV there, and I was sleeping in the RV with a furnace going. And uh, they were both, style, yeah, right? <laughs> they were both sleeping outside. And um, Eden heard this, um, the two of them coming at her, bipedal type steps. And you know how a kid will kind of uh, slap their feet on the ground as they're running. Mm-hmm. Right. It kind of sounded like that. One of them ran by the um, head of her cot, and the other one ran by the foot of her cot, and um, it tagged her on the leg as it went by. And my dog is. She's not afraid of anything except for Bigfoot. Um, mm-hmm. she, I've seen her chase wild boar. Uh, I haven't seen her around a bear, you know, but uh, there's just not too much that she won't uh, get after. And is but she ran time? under, yeah, she ran under Eden's cot and was whimpering and shaking that night. At first, Eden thought a uh, booger had uh, crawled under her cot, so she was laying real still. She thought she had a Bigfoot underneath her. Mm-hmm. Laying but, still. Uh, is no that the, way. Is, no is, way, Val. Is that no the same way. beagle that you were talking about? Yes. Yeah. One, hey, one, yeah. Well, do you know what counting coup is? The word counting coup? I do. Yeah. And um, uh, share it with it share it with Grizz here. And your yeah, audience. it's um, it's an Indian uh, an old Indian phrase. Um, I, I may butcher this a little bit, but mm-hmm. uh, that's okay. I'll help uh, you. 
<laughs> yeah, especially um, uh, young Braves. It it uh, it was a uh, show of courage, and um, um, I guess courage is about probably about the best word. But they would um, go up and touch um, a, an enemy mm-hmm. with a stick or whatever. Um, but they would, uh, you know, and and usually it was a live enemy, you know, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah. I've seen it spelled a couple different ways, uh, C O O O or uh, C O U P. Exactly. I think possibly C O U P is a, yeah, like it's correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, um, young Braves, especially, it was a, a, a show of uh, their bravery and courage mm-hmm. to uh, go up and touch a live enemy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's somewhat of a rite of passage. You go from child to man. You go you go from a nobody to a warrior, you know, someone well, to be looked at. They will see. not make it to a warrior if they touch Grizzly. <laughs> I promise you that. <laughs> but I see a lot of I see a lot of that stuff uh, wow. in the uh, database. Um, little things like that, such as running up behind somebody, nobody's provoking them, running up behind somebody and knock the pipe out of their mouth. You know, they they smoke people smoke the pipes and stuff, knock the Knock the daylights out of the man, knock the pipe out of his mouth, cause him to break a pallet, uh, run up to, behind somebody and knock a, a heavy box of tools out of their hands, uh, run up behind somebody hiking in a group and knock the hat off his head, the baseball cap off his head. That's counting coup. That's getting close to the enemy and showing their bravery and their their vigor and uh, their manhood, but that's what I, it's I would about. be in a hospital. I mm-hmm. would be on medication. I'd be in a straitjacket. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. no, I mean Val, what would you do? You, you and I out in the woods, and one come up, knocked your head off. What would you do, really? Well, given the given the uh, the opportunity that that I see, you know, if I, if it's one of those things, nothing. Yeah. Hello, goodbye, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't want anything to do with that. Well, I don't either. I would crap no, myself no. and probably pass out. No, you know, when I seen, when I had my encounter, I was strapped carrying, you know, what I usually carry, the 40 caliber to my waist. I always did. And I had no intention of using that. There was no way. Looking at that thing, looking at me, looking at it, no. You know, it's a wonderful thing that that uh, some of these some of these individuals uh, know the valor of peace. Certainly, I mean, in 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 as a student of of strategy and tactics and stuff, a chess player as I am, um, it it says a lot about your opponent. If that opponent stronger than you, physically or otherwise allows you an, an escape passage. This happened all throughout the Civil War. These are these are generals looking at strategies and stuff. There's a lot of respect. There's a lot of a lot of something to be said about your opponent knowing full well that they can annihilate you, but they allow you an opportunity to leave, an avenue to leave. That is something that's repeated through Sun Tzu, the art of war. But okay, that's now, you know a lot of times when you're looking at Sasquatch and stuff, they're very smart. Now they're very I'm smart. Gonna put, I'm going to put you back in uniform. <laughs> now that happens with the human being, what are you going to do? Let it go. Let it ride. You know. Now you it, it up you're going to drop them. You're gonna you're gonna shoot. You're gonna shoot that person to the to, to stop the threat. Brother, look at these correct? big brown eyes. Look at these big brown eyes. They're just full of peace and I, tranquility. I am too. Grizzly's peaceful. <laughs> but if I'm in uniform and I got somebody going to come up and attack me, yes, I'm going to use deadly physical force. You know, you so, you you do you do what you have to do at the moment. That's that's what that you do. Correct. You know. Now uh, I am a no kill person, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Everybody knows that. Mm-hmm. I am very peaceful. But I do go out by myself, and I do get scared. Yes, I do. So, Mark Daniels, I do. I I, I get nervous. I'm, when I hear a twig break, 
I get real silent. <laughs> it may be a deer. Yeah. It may be a possum. But, you know, I get very. Maybe something else. Worried. Yes, mm -hmm. it may be. Mm -hmm. So. I think um, they um, uh, have an air of uh, self-preservation about them also. Mm -hmm. uh, they are aware of what firearms are. You know, I mean, we have hunting yeah. seasons where we kill animals and you know they, they're very much aware even if they haven't had a personal experience uh they know that we carry guns and that sort of thing um i they're from what i have learned is they're very temperamental beings mm -hmm. um they um um i don't know I, i've heard other people uh state this that they kind of borderline artist uh autistic Autism. Autism, yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and um, they just have a, a a character about them uh, that that is reflective of that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if they crawl, if they get upset and cross the line, they can be a, a, a serious danger. Oh yeah. But I think up until that point, they see us as a threat, and they keep themselves in check and and in reserve. Um. Yeah. I agree. They know the business end of a rifle. Yeah. Smartly so. And I've heard the same thing about, about the autism part in, in examples. Um, and, and as far as the temperamental goes, these are not kitties. These are not pets. These are not something that you can tame like a dog. These are remarkably strong individuals, beings. They're, um, they're, as you said, they're temperamental. They're unforgiving. Uh, they can be very vicious and uh, very territorial, very loyal to their, to their kind. Not my kind, not your kind, to their kind. If you annoy them, they annoy you back. Only they torment you. And they can they can devastate you. They can devastate your property, as far as damage goes. They can do a lot of things, and you get it in their head that you want to be a part of their their head, and you want to get in their mind. Let them look at you, let them sniff you. They'll follow you home, and they'll remind you what you did. That's the way I see Bigfoot Sasquatches. And that's why it doesn't make any sense to me to go out here and feed them potato chips and honey. Because, you know, you could do that if you'd like, but you're only going to cause somebody else grief and, and, and disharmony. You might love them. You might treat them and see them as pets and kitties, but your neighbors might not. And that's where you cause the problem. Because right. they're, you know how they're going to respond. I know how they're going to respond. And it's not fair to anybody. It's not fair to me, you, the neighbors. It's not fair to the Sasquatch to put them in that, in that harm. That's the way I look at it. And I'm so, so against uh, habituating and gifting and baiting and that kind of stuff. Because that's the kind of stuff. You know what I look at that, guys? Grizz and, and Mark, I see baiting as, as the same kind of people that do that kind of stuff, the same kind of people that go in these public toilets and load it up and walk away and left, leave somebody else stumble upon that. Oh, I'm 100% I'm serious. Let somebody else deal with the problem and the issue. Clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, Get I mean, me on a roll. Here. What, what I mean, he's right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I. I I um uh, I so I mean the way I look at this I mean, situation yeah, people it, go ahead the way I look at it is no, go ahead, if I go in if I go into um um a new area of the forest I kind of uh, treat it as I would a neighborhood I'm not familiar with. Uh, I've made the wrong turn in, um, say, New Orleans, Louisiana one time and got into a bad neighborhood. And I was just hoping I could get out of there without, you know, a carjacking or um, gunplay or what what have you. Mm. Um, I treat the National Forest the same way. Um, these things, uh, because of their level of intelligence, um, 
they can t take on certain human characteristics. There's some of them that can be crim criminal. Uh, some of them can be very uh, good natured. Um, you know, you, you have no idea what you're up against until they display uh, a, a one type of behavior or another. Uh, so I'm very cautious. You know, uh, there have been probably three occasions where I have left the area shortly after getting there because of uh, the vocalizations and my um, interpretation of what uh, might happen. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I became very uncomfortable, very I felt very unsafe and I would just throw my stuff back in the truck and leave. Mm -hmm. But uh you know, you, you've got to you got to have all that in mind when you're out there, because, um, you know, I've I've slept through some things like possibly when they come into camp and stuff, because what, what are you going to do? They're there. You're there, you know, and whatever unfolds is going to unfold. And I've uh, went back to sleep on occasion, you know, just let them do whatever they're going to do. Get up in the morning and start cutting sign, you know, looking for um, footprints and um, what have you. But um, anytime I, I feel unsafe, I don't hesitate. I just, I pack it up and leave. Mm -hmm. Smart man. I mean, Smart there's man. nothing you really can do because mm -hmm. I've heard, you know, eyewitnesses in reports that you fire a shot, mm -hmm. whether in their direction or just up in the air or in the dirt. Mm -hmm. The clan comes a running, mm -hmm. and now you got problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. And that's not that's not good. So yeah. No, so ladies and cool. gentlemen, that is that is a fact. I, I've mm -hmm. got many reports of that over the years. Mm -hmm. So firing mm -hmm. rounds off does not scare them away. Just FYI, just mm -hmm. letting you know. You may think it does. It may it may a, a kitty cat. It may coyotes, but Bigfoot and Sasquatches, no. It mm -hmm. alerts them, and especially if it's mm -hmm. juveniles involved, mommy and daddy will come running. Mm -hmm. Trust me. I've heard yep. it before. And I, well, I'm actually um, the guest on one of, on one of our shows. Mm -hmm. Remember? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Absolute truth. Yeah, it's so, crazy. There was crazy. an area, there was a there was an area in southeast Oklahoma about four years ago that we were going into, and I had been researching this area for um, uh, probably uh, a, at least a year, scouting and what have you, and I was following the tree structures and looking for fresh ones, you know, to try to figure out where they were actually at in that forest at that time, and I kind of narrowed it down to one valley. And the road into this valley was an old uh, abandoned logging road, very primitive. You had to drive over saplings and stuff. You could just barely see the two track. I had to call, uh, cross a couple of tree creeks. Uh, have to put it four wheel drive a time or two. But anyway, got back down in there and went almost as far as we could go. And I had another individual with me and it was getting late. And we need to get back to camp. We knew the other guys would be cooking dinner and what have you. So it was about 530 in the afternoon. So we turned around. And uh, on the way out, uh, he had seen some uh, areas, um, some rocks w that had nuts cracked on top of them. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? A nut cracking station or whatever, where right. they were taking um, little rocks and breaking nuts uh on top of the big rocks so we stopped and looked at that and while we were bent over looking at that there's about six of those uh areas or places where they've been cracking nuts a uh, sizable limb about uh five foot long about maybe four inches in diameter came sailing down the um, hill at us and uh, it was flying horizontal so it didn't fall out of a tree so anyway um we um and I, I looked up the hill and I could see the uh, top of a head um, looking out over a root ball of a down tree. Uh, I could see him from the eyes up. That was one situation where I, we had a staring contest for a little while. And finally, I turned and um, focused my binoculars in the opposite direction. And when I turned back around, he was gone. But um, um, I um, 
the next morning that that friend he had to go back home he was working the next day so we were talking about it in camp that night and um, another individual wanted to go down and look at that and see where it was at and everything so i took him down there the next morning when we got down to the same place that we turned around the day before there were eight trees down blocking the road Wow. And uh, these were these were big trees. These weren't little saplings. Uh, the base of the trees were probably 75, 80 yards apart, you know, the trunks. But the way the trees were bent, pushed over, broke there. I, I, I can't remember exactly. I think three of them were pushed over. Um, let's see. Two of them were bent trees that were being held down by the other trees that were pushed over. And um, a couple or three of them were broke. Uh, they weren't pushed over. They just broke. And the tops of these trees overlapped each other. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it wasn't storm damage. You know, there was no storm in the area that night. But from 530 in the afternoon until about 10 o'clock the next morning when we got back down there, eight trees was blocking that two track to keep us from going any farther down in that valley. Mm -hmm. At the biggest tree that was pushed over, we found a couple impressions in the sand that measured in excess of 20 inches, somewhere between 20 and 22 inches. And it was almost eight feet apart from one foot to the next. It was like this thing, um, you know, spread his feet apart to get up against this tree and push it over. Now, I will say that um, the ground was uh, moist, it had been raining previously. So it wasn't like they were pushing over um, trees and hard packed earth. It was um, kind of a sandy loam soil uh, mm -hmm. and it was wet. But um, uh, some of these trees were, um, I don't know, about 12 inches diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, there might have been a couple of them a little bit bigger than mm -hmm. that. Uh, that was a few years ago. I recently took somebody else in there uh, this past year to show them where it was at. And those trees are those tree trunks are still there, but mm -hmm. the Forest Service or somebody has taken a chainsaw in there and cut them to mm -hmm. where you can get down the two track. Mm -hmm. So um, did you guys I've hear any in that area? Did you guys hear any of these trees falling at night? No, we were too far away from there. Uh -oh. uh, our camp was probably three or four miles away. Um, I've been back into that area since then, and I don't think the uh, the Sasquatches are occupying that area. There's mm -hmm. no new structures. Um, a few of the old structures are still there, but uh, weather and time has deteriorated them. You know, they, they're starting to rot. Usually a structure will be rotten and non-existent in, a, mm -hmm. in about five years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they'll be fairly fresh for about a year and then uh, deer will rub up against them or, you know, the wind the storms will start to take them apart. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But th that area just doesn't seem to be as active right now as it was a few years ago. So I think mm -hmm. they've moved on. And, and and there you don't see very many deer or even the hogs are not don't have the presence that they used to have. So I think they will uh, eventually deplete uh, the food sources in an area. Mm -hmm. And then they'll relocate, you know, maybe mm -hmm. 10 or 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they're, would make sense, Val. Yeah, they're following the food, you know. I mean, if, if they're depleting the food source in that area, right, or the food mm -hmm. source is migrating, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20 miles I've, away. Uh, Go ahead. Um, the seasonal uh, fruits and stuff like persimmons, for instance, you know, they usually um, uh, ripen after the first uh, freeze. Mm -hmm. And we found an area uh, in the wild that had several persimmon trees. And you'll see a trail going into that area. And then once they get to the, a tree, we call it a, um, um, a, um, a ring around the tree. There, there'll be a trail uh, in a circle fashion around that tree. And they'll walk around that tree picking the fruit out of it. And then there'll be a trail from that tree to the next tree. And then there'll be a circle around that tree where they walk around it picking the fruit out of it. 
So you'll see stuff like that on a seasonal basis too, as as berries and fruit and stuff come into season. Wow. That's interesting. Very, very interesting. So that's one of the things that I've noticed in 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 uh, uh, studying and researching Bigfoot reports. It's it's uh, they're not only meat eaters; they're veg vegetarians. They love Mayhew berries, as Mark alluded to. There's other types of berries they enjoy: cranberries, apples. I mean, they'll deplete a whole orchard if you if you allow them to. Anybody, I would say that that has an orchard in their backyard, their back pasture, um, that wants to see a Bigfoot, stick around and watch watch your orchards when they're in in season. Your chances of seeing one are very high. Your chances of seeing one are very high if you live close to cornfields, in soybean fields. These are these are product. These are food sources for these animals. So uh, we uh, we startled one about a year ago. Um, we were actually on our four wheelers. There's three of us and we were going down a, um, a utility right away. And uh, it was deep in the woods. And uh, uh, we passed a, a kind of a clearing to our left, an open area. And I happened to look over that way. I was bringing up the rear. And there was a Sasquatch standing behind a tree. Of course, he was hanging out both sides of the tree. And um, I slammed on my brakes and hit reverse to back up so I could see him again. And he was gone. And so uh, I got the attention of the other two. They came back there and uh, we walked back there where he was at. We found his footprint and um, uh, we found what he would, was possibly doing. He was digging grubs out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen uh, an armadillo or um, even my dog will sniff out a grub every once in a while and dig it up. But um, he, he, he was using his hands. We found the fingernail, you know, claw marks and stuff where he was uh, digging the grubs. I don't know if he was the, the, he, the, um, he wasn't uh, focused like an armadillo would be, you know, where they'll dig a fairly small hole mm -hmm. digging the grub out. Um, this was like, um, a couple feet, uh, square or something like that. So mm -hmm. I don't know if he was just, uh, if he was able to smell them, uh, like, a, a another animal would, or if he was just, uh, digging the ground, hoping to find them, but that's what it looked like he was doing. And, uh, we found a partial footprint over there behind that tree that he was hiding behind when I went by, mm -hmm. but, uh, they, they, my opinion is they eat just about anything that's edible in the forest. Uh, they can true. eat things that, that we can't. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they their diet during the winter months are more protein oriented, hogs and deer and, you know, stuff like that. But in the uh, uh, spring and, and early summer, they've got a, um, a salad bar that they mm -hmm. can pick from. Mm -hmm. And they'll eat just about everything out there. Well, I've, I've noticed that a lot of times uh, when we talk about tree formations, we must talk about rock formations, too. Uh, a lot of times there's stacked rocks and a lot of people in conversation over the meaning of this. We all look at it as communication and stuff. But a lot of Sasquatch and Bigfoot have been known to use these rock stacks as a food source. Not only a food source, but a, but a natural heater. Rock absorbs heat at in, at night when the when the nights get cool they they go around and hug these uh, these rocks for for warmth, but they also in the summer heat they'll take the rocks and lift them up and they'll find the rodents the rat and mice underneath the rocks and they eat these things that's a food source heater and food source it's ingenious it's ingenious I have um uh. I have photographs of about a half a dozen or so um, rock stacks that I have found deep in the woods. Mm -hmm. If um, I run across something um, in a, in an area that's frequented by hunters and it's close to the road or at the road uh, mm -hmm. way, I don't think too much of it. But when you get mm -hmm. back deeper in the woods and, and find a stack of rocks, we mm -hmm. found one um, a while back 
that almost looked like the shape of a, a person, mm -hmm. uh, a, a hominoid. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was in this particular area. We have also found um, uh, stick formations that are works of art, mm -hmm. very artistic. So we we got a very talented booger back in there building mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the way the the, the the stuff is intertwined and laced together, and I mm -hmm. mean he or she has taken considerable time putting this together. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, stick formations are like business cards. They're business cards. Let me just show you something here. A typical business card is telling you about, if that was me, it was telling you about me. This is the business I do. And, and when I study and analyze these, these animals and objects and trees, I call them ornaments. That's what they are. They're ornaments, just like we put ornaments on Christmas trees. To them, it's ornaments and trophies. To, to predator people on the street, uh, doing that kind of stuff to different animals and different people, those are trophies. They want to remember these things. And they also do this because to them, a lot of these tree formations and things that they put in trees, they do it for your sake and my sake so we can see it. And they're telling what, it, what they're communicating is, this is me. This is what I do. Do you want some of me? Come on over here and be here at this certain time. And, and, and if I'm here, you get with me and you can, you can be part of this. That's the way I look at this stuff. That's trees and ornaments. Um, I think uh, uh, some of the tree breaks can be viewed that way also, mm -hmm. uh, especially the ones that are high up, you know, like um, mm -hmm. uh, eight to 12 foot in the air. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a, you know, three or four inch tree that's been snapped over. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could very possibly be a show of, of strength and uh, size. You know, I'm this big and I can do this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be warned. In Michigan, we found a we found a very very large teepee structure made out of logs. I mean, these are trees. These were actual trees on the on the lake shore of, of uh, Lake Erie. Very very large. If you can imagine a teepee right on the shore of uh, Lake Erie, something very large put that up, and they put that up for a reason. They put it up for people to see and to understand with their eyes. This is. This is my this is my area. You come in here to my area. You deal with me. This is me. Uh, and and some of the some of the Native American uh, literature that I've read on this type of subject says that a lot of these extra super large uh, tree structures, as you're talking about, Mark, are from very alpha uh, oriented males. This is their area. They're telling you who they are, and people and and individuals like them recognize that. We should too. We should recognize that. We have an upside down tree. It's a cypress tree in uh, Louisiana, that's uh, in the woods, mm -hmm. at a point to where you couldn't get uh, machinery back in there to to do this. Uh, this this uh, cypress tree. Uh, there, there's a formula that you can go online uh, that loggers use. Uh, you take the length of the uh, trunk, mm -hmm. uh, the size of the big end, size of the little end. There's a formula that you can use to calculate the weight. Uh, of course, uh, moisture content is a variable. Mm -hmm. So um, if it, if the tree has just been freshly cut down, then you can say it's got a fairly high moisture content. Mm -hmm. If it's a year old, then the moisture content is going to be greatly less. But anyway, um, when I first uh, saw this uh, cypress tree, upside down shoved into the ground perfectly straight up and down mm -hmm. uh i estimated it to have probably weighed about 750 pounds i did um uh, after um um about a year from the first time i saw it until mm -hmm. i went back i uh, took a small shovel and i tried to dig down to see how far it was in the ground mm -hmm. i dug down 18 inches and i hadn't mm -hmm. reached the end of it yet the end of it yeah now this was in a swampy area. Uh, that area had flooded once upon a time, a couple of years prior, uh, and was underwater. Uh, it's sandy soil. So, uh, you know, 
that can um, justify how it got shoved into the ground. Mm -hmm. But I have um, seen and read other reports of upside down trees. Uh, I've, I've found other upside down trees that are basically leaning up against uh, the trunk is leaning up against another tree. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the only one I've seen that was actually shoved into the ground. Now, I've got photos like like database. I've got uh, a document, not real large. I got documents of purported Bigfoots. I've got documents of different tree structures and items found animate and inanimate objects found in trees. One of them is upside down trees, or we call them inverted trees, inverse, and the opposite of the inverse is standing upright. Now, amongst uh, like-minded people, the thought is that the inverse trees, meaning the opposite way, that's a rage. That's a statement of rage, anger. You understand that. You take a tree, it takes a, a powerful amount of force to drive that, that tree into the ground no matter if it's anger, it's rage. And for whatever reason, that is a statement for people to see and other Bigfoots to, to know and understand. Um, I don't know. That's that's one of the things that, that a lot of people talk about, you know, that, that are enthusiasts like you and me, Grizz. Um, but that's an interesting, interesting topic there. You know, it... it, it it might be that um, when you find um, a display like that, it could be a situation where an alpha male is being challenged. Yes. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, had um, posted uh, some photos of um, what I call goalposts, but um, horizontal tree trunks up in mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I, I have found a few of those, and uh, yeah. I, I carry. After I found the first one, I started carrying a rangefinder with me. Mm -hmm. If you understand, know what a rangefinder oh, is, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I can stand under the tree and uh, shoot up to it and find out how high it is off the ground. Mm -hmm. And then I can uh, measure it by uh, shooting up to one end and then walking over to the other end, mm -hmm. uh, shooting up to it, and uh, then calculating across the ground uh, how many feet it is. And then using that loggers uh, formula that I referenced, um, mm -hmm. you can uh, estimate the size of it. Mm -hmm. And even if it's a uh, uh, well seasoned and um, uh, doesn't have much moisture in it, you know we're still talking several hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, the highest one that I found up in the air, and it was wedged uh, uh, between two trees, and it was on some smaller branches. Uh, uh, if it had fallen somehow, some way, uh, uh, it would have broke those branches on the way down, you know, mm -hmm. but it was obviously lifted up in the air, 15 feet up in the air. Mm -hmm. It probably weighed, uh, in excess of 500 pounds, maybe as much as 700 pounds when mm -hmm. it was placed up there. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's just, a uh, stuff like that just blows me away. Mm -hmm. I found one, one time that was wedged up there like that. And then there was a, uh, Y branch. Mm -hmm. that was uh, stuck up there dead center in the middle of it. Hmm. Um, don't know what that communication was all about, but it was, mm -hmm. it was very interesting to see. <clears throat> and if you notice that that uh, series of photos that I posted on my group site, I tried to make them, I tried to put the collage up there showing different species of trees. One was, one was uh, cedar, one was uh, birch, another probably maple i don't or oak i don't know i don't remember which but it shows you different parts um different parts of the uh woods or forest that you might find these things but it's so it was it was pretty interesting and to see and to see a purported uh sasquatch near one of those uh goal posts as you call it uh was quite interesting very interesting you know, some of the uh, smaller structures that we run across could very well be child's play, you know, done by mm -hmm. the juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like I used to push a toy pickup around mimicking my dad going to work and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the South, uh, the structures that we run across are not near as, as big as uh, the ones you all see 
probably up in your part of the country, uh, a lot of ours are done with saplings instead mm -hmm. of mature trees. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think many of them are probably done uh, by the juveniles just messing around, you know, mm -hmm. play, play claiming the territory or something mm -hmm. like that. Really I learning. also kind of suspect that uh, maybe some of the, uh, uh, the structures, like maybe an X structure or something like that, might be a boundary for the kids. In other words, mm -hmm. you know, don't go any farther away from home than uh, this uh, this marker you you're, you're speaking of the x marker now for everybody to see it's an x marker a simple right. x we all recognize it but um, there's a there's an article that i have uh in my file someplace that speaks of an old native american uh chief that that tells youngsters you see those stick structures, those those cross sticks. You look at that, you recognize it, you remember it, and stay out of that area. That's there for a reason. And and I want I want the rest of you, and and when you have children, you share the same information with with them. Stay out of that area. That's that's an elderly person speaking to a smaller, younger child about the X the X markers. I have an idea about that. You see a railroad crossing in Texas, Kentucky, Michigan. What do we see up there at the warning gates? Don't we also see the crosses? What does a cross mean? What does that cross at the railroad crossing mean? You see that. I don't forget about the bells and the, the flashing lights. We see that cross, and that cross tells us what? There's danger, caution. Yeah, it's Be a careful. warning. There you go. So uh, we can take that any way, any way from here to Sunday. Um, I'll, I'll uh, if it's up to me, I'll go with the the advice of the Native American uh, chief, the elder. He, they they know best, really. I'll use my common sense, and I'll see it as I'll see it as good advice, good timely advice. I'll also see it as as uh, X marks the spot as far as a meeting place or something else. But always in the back of my mind, guys, I'm always thinking about what I read, the old chieftain telling his kids, you remember that X, you remember that marker that's there for a reason. You know, the, the structure I mentioned earlier. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Missy wants to know, Mark, what do you think they do with their dead? Do you think they bury their dead or? Uh, I, I believe they do. Uh, my nephew and I came across a grave in the forest and it wasn't a large grave. It was only about uh, four, four foot long. And um, uh, it obviously was a grave of some sort. Uh, we probed down a ways to see how deep the loose dirt was. And, uh, you know, a couple of feet down, it was loose. Uh, it had flat rocks, kind of like tile work, covering the top of it. Uh, they gathered up, whoever did it, gathered up flat rocks and laid it out across the top of this grave. The grave was in, um, I, I call it a grave because that's what it looked like. It was in a uh, mound, a typical mound type formation uh, with the flat rocks on top of it. Uh, if it was a grave, it might have been an infant. Um, it could have been somebody's uh, pet dog, but it's very unlikely because of where it was located way back in the forest. Nobody in their right mind would have driven 10 or 12 miles back in there to uh, and, and, and then hiked uh, to this point to bury a pet. Um, I actually was going to um, dig it up at one point. Uh, but I was going to go in with four or five people so two or three could stand guard while a couple of us uh, did the excavation. I bought a couple of books on um, uh, Val Help Me. Uh, I guess it's forensic uh, mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. on de de uh, decay and stuff like that. I was mm -hmm. going to use uh, one of those metal probes mm -hmm. like plumbers use to find sewer lines and stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to pick that down and then sniff of it when I pulled it back out to see if I could detect mm -hmm. decaying flesh or what have you. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the in the aftermath of us 
kind of messing with this thing. We didn't dig it up, but we uh, probed around and we dug a little bit and, you know, uh, to see how loose the dirt was, what have you. We had some strange occurrences in that area uh, immediately after that. We were camping uh, 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 probably less than a mile away. And that night we were inundated with orbs. Um, and, and one of them was kind of scary because it was on the ground coming towards us. I don't know what orbs are, what they mean, but uh, I've had about, I don't know, maybe uh, five or six situations now where I've been in an area where Bigfoot uh, have, was suspected to be, and we um, we are, you know, inundated with these orbs. We had these things coming down the hill behind us that night, and you could and see, uh, as they passed in front of a tree, you could see the light reflecting off the tree. As they passed behind a tree, you could see um, it blink out for a minute. Um, the one that uh, uh, that worried us the most was a red one about the side, and it was coming up the road towards us. And, and uh, without getting too too uh, uh, long story, uh, we had. Um, we were in an area with no cell coverage. I knew about four miles away on a, on a top of hill, I had cell uh, coverage. So my nephew and I, we went up to that uh, point. Uh, we both had our vehicles full, uh, so we couldn't both ride in the same vehicle. Uh, so we took both of our vehicles up there and uh, I placed a call to Eden to let her know where we was at and what was going on. And while we were, uh, we had her on the speakerphone and my nephew was standing beside my truck and we were both talking to her and he looked behind my truck and this red orb was coming up the road about a foot or two off the ground. Uh-oh. What happened? Experienced some bad Wi-Fi service. Yeah. But that's we pretty interesting told. about about the wife about the uh, orbs it very, is it is very very interesting it's kind of creepy but um some of the things that uh, mark was was talking about uh i've also learned and heard, here he is back here there he is there we yeah, go sorry. yeah sorry yeah sorry uh my signal dropped and mm -hmm. i lost it but anyway um we both got spooked when we saw that red orb. I saw it out uh, of my rear view mirror and he was looking at it. He says, let's get out of here. So we did. Um, we had, uh, we had intended to um, sleep in a tent that night, but we decided both of us to sleep in our pickups. And um, I was awake most of the night. I had the window crack listening and looking. Uh, we weren't smart enough to leave. You know, we, we stuck it out, but um I kind of took that as a maybe a warning to leave the grave alone. Mm -hmm. And um, I went back looking for it here uh, recently and I couldn't find it. I don't know if it got moved or, or I just was looking in the wrong direction, but I honestly believe they, they buried their dead. I mean, that is a good question. I mean, that's always been a question and I never had an answer, you know, and mm -hmm. I thought they probably did. Uh, I know that allegedly, uh, I know they do bleed. I know that they do die uh, from being shot. I know they carried their wounded and dead off. So, yes, they must do something with them. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Val. Well, I've heard, I've heard the same thing. The only difference is I've heard that uh, they bury them underneath trees. Uh, I even got it. I had a report of what they thought was a Bigfoot funeral, and they seen weeping by a crowd of um, individuals, and they believed that that funeral was or that gathering was ceremony was about a infant that they had lost, and they had in that case dug a, a deep pit and then piled it with rocks, as as you mentioned, Mark. So there's some parallel, interesting parallels between what you what you said and and what I found, you know, in that in that area. So, I found a uh, uh, series of structures one time in the same general area where this uh, grave uh, grave we found. Um, 
this um, took up about two acres, and I can only describe it as a cathedral. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the uh, structures were um, trees bent over and intertwined with each other. And when I walked into it, it was like walking into a church. That was the feeling that I had. It was uh, kind of overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. It was very significant. Mm -hmm. Parts of it is still standing today, five years later. Um, um, I took uh, Eden there not too long ago and uh, showed it to her. Some of the uh, uh, the lacing and stuff where the trees were, um, I mean, this area has had several storms and uh, high winds and stuff, and which has taken some of it down. Some of the um, uh, freestanding structures are no longer there. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they fell over and rotted and what have you. But um, I just, I often wondered if this wasn't uh, either a, a sign of celebration or grievance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some, something significant like a, a death of a uh, infant or possibly um, they, they have um, alpha males, but they also have alpha females. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Somebody exactly. of significance in the plan, you know, may have passed away and they built this memorial. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was just amazing to see. Mm -hmm. And the photographs don't do it justice. You know, no. uh, you can only take a picture of one structure at a time, but you can't take in two acres of this stuff mm -hmm. like you do when you're standing underneath it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. MK uh, was on earlier and he was he was. Uh, mentioning the same thing that so many times we take videos and pictures of something, but when it's, and, and when it's published, uh, it's not exactly what our eyes seen. We know in our mind what we've seen. And, and uh, it was a whole lot better than what the uh, magics of uh, pictures and photographs can do for it and stuff. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, um, it's very interesting. What do you think? Chris? I, 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 I totally agree with them. I mean, once again, it's, it's the same thing uh, from different areas of the country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're, we're hearing the same reports, but from different people, uh, we're getting new information uh, that hopefully that it will help you out during your investigations with, you know, and different opinions. So when you're out there in the woods, boots on the ground, I mean, look for stuff like this. I mean, mm -hmm. if you see a bunch of rocks laying down, I mean, I wouldn't dig it up. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be afraid, but you know, that may be something there. Yes. I would assume. I mean, you're not going to find a bunch of rocks, you know, unless it's a creek. You know, you know, I mean, at, Vikings used to do that when people died. But as wow. as as food for another day and another talk, there is an uncanny um, curiosity as to why, what fetish, what unhealthy reason would a Bigfoot Sasquatch have in digging up human remains, human bodies in the cemetery? I heard and they that. Had, they, they have a propensity to do this kind of stuff. They sniff the ground. Uh, and, and by the way, there's 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 dogs, Godiva dogs that are used to smell um, uh, decayed body underneath the ground as well as underneath the water. There's also instruments, as you as you said, Mark, that, that, that probe and smell and sniff and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond me that I see these reports of Sasquatch uh, hanging around cemeteries with their nose to the ground and digging. Some of them, in some cases, there was a report, there was a video on, on the YouTube for a long time. I mean, it was there in plain black or plain color view for everybody to see. It was a juvenile Sasquatch going, going to town, hauling the mail, just digging that digging that uh, that grave up and it was on video and it was taken down two or three times and brought back up again whoever took the video um maybe got a lot of maybe got the word to take the video down but it was taken down a couple times but it you know it wasn't a monkey and it wasn't a bear and it wasn't a dog digging it was a sasquatch for sure 
we have a couple of cemeteries in uh, Louisiana that we camp at. Um, mm -hmm. And all I can say is it's, it's high strangeness, high mm -hmm. strangeness. Exactly. Um, one of them that we've camped at several times, we first, uh, we were camping about a quarter mile away and we observed uh, this light display over the top of this cemetery. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what it is, uh, you know, it's, but it was, it was very weird. Uh, there was no light sources in that part of the country that it could have came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, we observed that um, twice on two different occasions. And there was um, probably at least uh, four or five of us in the group each time we observed it. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, um, maybe it's some kind of earth energy, um, um, you know, electromagnet and, magnetism and and uh, photons and you know i have mm -hmm. no idea what it was i know mm -hmm. i can all i can say is i saw it and i'm here to report it mm -hmm. but um we have we camp in those uh, cemeteries because of the vocalizations and all the um uh, interactions that we have mm -hmm. um, i caught uh, one on thermal one time uh, near one of the cemeteries the second cemetery we just recently started camping at because well we really haven't spent the night there yet We've uh, spent a few hours, but uh, we're interested in it because of all the vocalizations that's coming from that uh, area. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they do seem to have um, some attraction to cemeteries. I, I'm not sure why, but we, ju we just uh, we've noted that and observed it. It's you know, creepy. I, I, yeah, I don't uh, uh, pretend to be an expert on any of this. I'm just an observer. I, mm -hmm. I consider myself a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. uh, an enthusiast. Um, as I said at the beginning of this um, um, podcast, uh, I became interested in it after my daughter had that face-to-face uh, -face with one. And I'm just curious as to what's in the forest. That, you know, when we go camping and, and, um, and go enjoy the outdoors, what's out there with us? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a threat? Uh, is there something we need to be concerned about? Mm -hmm. um, I've just recently started wrapping my head around this dog man situation. Um, and it kind of like, uh, Bigfoot has been in the past. There's just too many stories and too many encounters to completely ignore. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't had any experiences, but, um, I'm just becoming more cautious, mm -hmm. uh, of the threat as I mm -hmm. go into the woods, you know. Mm -hmm. I think all of my encounters thus far have been Bigfoot related. I don't think I've experienced anything else from any other type of entity. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, while I'm thinking of it, um, the structure that I mentioned earlier that was built beside my pickup while I was away from my pickup, mm -hmm. that was an X structure. It, uh, it had another supporting member holding it up, but it was basically an X structure. Um, that was uh, the second time that a structure had been built while I was in the area. Mm -hmm. uh, the other time was I, I was going down this logging road and there were structures in the area and I was stopping and photographing them. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably took pictures of three or four of them. And um, um, I went down this road and I was very observant because I had seen a couple stop and took pictures of them. And I got down as far as I could go and I had to turn around and um, on the way back out, there was a structure that wasn't there beside the road when I went down and I got out to look at it and started to take pictures of it. And I noticed a 22 inch footprint and I did have a tape measure on me and I did measure it, uh, but there was a fresh footprint in the soft dirt at the uh, bar ditch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as I'm bending over looking at this thing, a cold chill went up my back and I couldn't get to my truck fast enough to get out of there. I just, just sudden fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had casting material with me. My first thought was to cast it. My, you know, first thing I did was measure it to, it was um, 22 inches and a little over 10 inches wide at the ball of the foot. Oh, hey. But uh, I just, uh, there's been a few occasions like that where fear would overcome me and I would just get out of there as fast as I could. And that was one of those cases. I kind of suspect that might've been the same individual that pushed those eight trees over that time because it was in the same general area at 22 inches. That would probably put him up there. What around 12 foot tall or so. Yes, exactly. I, I was just looking myself and, um, the formula for that is is 22 inches 
multiply by 6.5. You take your answer and divide that by 12 inches, 12 inches to a foot. And it comes out to 11.99 something, something, something. You know, Val's hungry. It's time to go kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 12 foot. Uh, earlier, MK was talking about that that big boy that stepped in the in this in the middle of uh, black and white uh, Bigfoot in the middle of a kerfuffle. He 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 says that he estimated that to be around twelve foot. That's pretty big. Yeah, I, I mean, know I about you. I yeah. remember seeing that video, and yeah. uh, the two that were um, uh, tussling were big enough, mm -hmm. probably in the neighborhood of eight foot. But when that mm -hmm. third one came onto the scene. He was a giant. Yeah, he was. This is a this is a seven foot basement. This is pretty deep, Michigan basement. Seven foot, no stooping or anything. It's deep. Now, I can't imagine twelve foot. Twelve foot is 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 jello legs, loose bowels, and leaky bladders. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling, oh, you. Okay. I'm telling you, it's it's huge. I can't even be imagine being touched by one, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know? But if I you thank ever you, Mr. Daniels, um, for coming on the show. I mean, yeah. interesting, you know? Thank you very much. Outstanding. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. That's for sure. Sorry, sorry about the technical difficulty. I'm um, kind of out in the country, and I've got a weak signal. Some of y'all's uh, dialogue was a little bit garbled, but I picked up enough of it to know what she's talking about. So, No, it was great, wasn't it, Val? I think Val froze on us. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had, that he or, has either that or he went to dinner on us. He uh he hasn't moved for a while, so I think he he may have fell asleep. It, yeah, he probably has. He said he was getting <laughs> hungry, but I thank you, Mr. Daniels. Take care, okay. and we'll see you All again. Right. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Bye. Right, bye bye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. Throwing the bones and ram the cage with Grizzly and Gumshoe Val. So yes, Missy Existers, Johnny Half. Boy, I tell you, when are we going to have some fun, you know, every night when we're live here? You know, what's going to happen? Shake, rattle, and roll. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. What a show we had tonight. Boy, I love it. I love it. Yes. 12 feet, 3.7 meters. Jeez, no. That is, I'm a midget. Oh, my God, Missy. Yes. I know, right? Can you imagine being touched by one? No, thank you. I couldn't do it. Absolutely not, crazy witch. That's what I'm saying. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we've got another show coming up at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Yeah. It's going to be deep. We're going to get into it. But this is live. Coast to coast. Around the world, God bless you all. Y'all have a good night. I guess Val's gone for the night. Oh, there's Val. There he is. Hey, Val, what's happening, baby? Hey, it's been a wonderful, great show, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good gas, good talk. Let me shout out to Bob Daigle, Michigan. My good friend, wow. Bob Daigle. Yeah, give that shout out. But anyways, Chris, I love you, brother. I mean, peace. Have That's fun. That's right. Enjoy. All right, bye brother. Bye-bye. All right. Everybody take care. We'll talk to you. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. Rock it on. Bye, Denise. Bye, Johnny. Bye, Crazy Witch. Take care, everybody. Until next Sunday. We'll see you. Peace. <laughs>